The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Hello and welcome back to Workbench Wednesdays. My name is James and on this show we talk about the equipment found on your electronics workbench. Well, except to do this episode, we're going to need a little bit of a venue change. Behind me are all of the components and materials I use in my projects. But even with all of these boxes, sometimes I have trouble finding things like a one kilo ohm resistor. And no, it's not an organizational problem, although we should talk about that sometime. I started to wonder what are the most essential components for an electronics kit? So I asked the Element 14 community and many members posted what their must have components were, which I compiled into a couple of lists. In this video, I cover passive components, which are things like capacitors and resistors. Now, my goal with this video is not to make you an expert on passive components. Instead, I wanna give you enough information to help you buy the essential parts you need to have on hand. Have you ever wondered why resistors come in values like 220, 270, or 330 ohms? Well, resistor values are grouped into an E series like E6 or E24. These are groups of common base values in multiples of tens or decades. For example, E6 contains six base values, while E12 has values in between those. Then the decade multiplier moves the decimal point around for even more values. The E-series has been around for a very long time, so consider it more of a guideline and not a standard. To me, the most important values are these, but having more on hand can be handy. One way to get a bunch of values is with a kit. For example, this Multicomp Pro kit has 3,100 resistors ranging from 10 ohms to one mega ohm with E6 values. I do recommend this kit because it's great if you need to quickly build up your resistor inventory. However, having them shipped in these plastic envelopes is kind of clumsy to work with, so you'll need to figure out a storage solution. Typical power ratings for resistors are 125, 250, or 500 milliwatts. For general purpose work, 250 milliwatts or quarter watt are okay, but I have one reason to consider 500 milliwatts. Higher wattage resistors have larger diameter leads. Working with the thicker leads of a 500 milliwatt resistor is much easier than a 125 or 250. But if you don't know what to start with, then get the 250 milliwatts. I might suggest a kit like the one I just mentioned and then buy some 500 milliwatt versions of the most common values. You might see resistors in beige, blue, or other colors. There is no standard for what these mean. However, in general, 10% tolerance carbon resistors are beige and 1% tolerance metal film resistors are blue. Remember that tolerance is the window of values that a resistor can have around its rated value. These days, I almost always buy 1% metal film resistors because they don't cost that much more than the 10% carbons. Also, when I buy surface mount, I always get 1% or less. There are many types of capacitors. Each has their own quirks, advantages, and disadvantages. But for the purpose of essential components, I recommend ceramic and aluminum electrolytic. Like resistors, capacitors also come in E-series values. They also have voltage ratings. Depending on the dielectric type, the voltage rating can mean slightly different things. However, one thing is certain for all capacitor types, do not exceed their rated voltage. If you are mostly using capacitors for decoupling circuits, you probably don't need a wide range of values. On the other hand, if you're designing filters, you may want to get an E12 or E24 range, and you might also consider a film dielectric. Ceramic capacitors are good for high frequency decoupling. Monolithic through hole caps like these are usually available with less than one microfarad. This particular kit contains the following values. As a starter set, that's a good range to have. The three I use most often are 22 picofarads, 10 nanofarads, and 100 nanofarads. Most monolithic ceramics rarely have their rated voltage printed on them, but they do tend to be either 25 or 50 volts. Capacitors commonly use a three-digit code for their value. The first two digits are significant, 
And the third is how many zeros you add to get a value in picofarads. So 103 is 10, zero, then 000, zero, zero picofarads, which is also 10 nanofarads. Sometimes capacitors use a letter to indicate their tolerance range. The three most common are J, K, and M. Although again, these are not really a standard, but more of a convention. Ceramic capacitors like the ones I showed here usually have a tolerance of 10 or 20%. But keep in mind that temperature, applied voltage, and age can affect their capacitance. Aluminum or aluminium electrolytic capacitors are great for bulk decoupling because they have relatively large capacitances. Unlike ceramics, electrolytics are polarized. So make sure a positive voltage is applied with respect to the cathode or negative terminal. This electrolytic kit contains these values split by two different voltage ranges. I consider the most important to be 1, 10, and 100 microfarads. The others are nice to have, but I rarely use them. One more rating to note on an electrolytic is temperature. These caps are rated for 85 degrees C. Operating an electrolytic below its rated voltage or temperature or both will extend its operational lifetime which is why so many people follow the 50% of rated voltage rule of thumb. Unlike resistors or caps, I only have a few words to say about push buttons. Both of these are through hole that cost about the same. The difference is the length of the finger pushy part and the force required to activate the switch. The red switches are five millimeters tall with a 260 gram force and the brown switches are four millimeters tall with a 160 gram force. Now, I'm not gonna get into what actuation force means and which is better. My suggestion to you is buy a couple of push buttons with different ratings to see which works best for you. Regarding ratings, switches have a maximum voltage and current rating. These are not, I repeat, not a power rating. The maximum current is based on the I squared R power law. So decreasing the applied voltage does not mean you can increase the maximum current. Also notice that this particular switch is rated for DC, but the dielectric withstanding rating is in AC. This dielectric strength does not mean you can use the switch with AC. Switch contacts for DC and AC tend to use different metal types. Do not use a switch only rated for DC in AC applications. Push buttons like these have four leads with two of the leads connected together. The way I remember which are connected is to imagine these as two staples. The claw tips that face each other are connected together like a staple. So these two are connected and these two are connected, but they're not connected together until I push the button. For wiring, I'm going to skip right past saying you need to get a breadboard. You need to get a breadboard. And instead, let's talk about the things you plug into the breadboard. There are a couple of jumper wire types that you'll need. First are these pre-cut wires in a set like this. These make building circuits quick and easy. I just recently learned this trick and it actually blew my mind. Notice how jumper wires are in various lengths. And also notice that the spacing on a breadboard is 0.1 inches apart. Turns out the color of the insulation indicates the length of the wire. This yellow wire is 0.4 inches. Now the trick is that that actually spans five holes. These follow the resistor color code plus one hole. And of course, unfortunately, not all jumper kits follow this convention, but almost all are cut to 0.1 inch lengths. So you'll have to check out to see what yours does. Another type of jumper wire is useful for off-board connections. They come in pin-pin, socket-socket, and pin-socket variations. I recommend a variety of length of each. Speaking of headers and sockets, you definitely want to have some breakaway headers in your kit. Look for 0.1 inch or 2.54 millimeter spacing and ideally pretend contacts. These easily break apart to whatever size you need, even without tools. Frankly, anytime I order parts, I try to get at least one stick of these in my cart. I usually look to see what is the largest or most number of positions that I can get at the lowest price. Their socket counterpart, however, is a little trickier. Once again, you want to have 0.1 inch spacing. However, pay very careful attention to whether they can be cut or not. The one on the left is not made to be cut while the one on the right is. And notice I said cut. Unlike headers, these do not break easily. When I need to make these smaller, I mark the pin of the one I need and then cut there. So notice how after I cut it that I actually damaged that pin that I marked. 
This doesn't always happen, but it can. Once that's broken away, you can sand it to make it look cleaner. Oh, 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 and watch out for these machine style sockets. They're way more common than the traditional square pin headers, but they use round pins and are very difficult to work with. They're really meant for a shipping product. Because of the difficulty of using these sockets, I prefer to either order the exact number of positions I need or just not use them. Instead, I'll use headers on my breakout board or whatever I'm trying to connect to the breadboard and then use the different jumper wires to make those connections. In fact, I don't even consider sockets essential, but I knew people would be upset if I didn't at least explain why I don't like them. Most people might say diodes are an active component because they're made with semiconductor materials. Personally, I think of them as a passive device, so I put them in an episode about passives. For essential components, you want to have at least a small signal diode and a power diode. The 1N4148 is better for high frequency circuits like digital logic, while power diodes like the 1N4000 series are great in high current applications like acting as a flyback. The last number in the 1N4000 series indicates the max voltage rating for the diode. Keep an eye on the forward voltage of that 1N4148. They are much lower than traditional silicon diodes. Two other diodes to consider adding to your kit are Schottky and Zeners. You can't actually tell the difference just by looking at them because diodes use common packages. For a Shockey, I recommend a 1N5818, which is good for power supply circuits. But Shockeys also come in small signal variants. For Zeners, I would grab some 3.3, 5.1, and 13 volt values so that you can use them as cheap overvoltage protection. And do not forget LEDs. Keep a couple of colors on hand and do not forget their current limiting resistors. Those are the passive components I consider essential in my electronics kit. I do not mean to say that you need to run out and buy everything I mentioned, but I hope you at least picked up a few tips for when you're trying to expand your kit. Remember that over on the Element 14 community, you can find show notes which include links to all of the parts that I mentioned in this episode. If you have questions about these components or need help selecting one, that is the best place to ask me because I'm more likely to see it and other community members can help too. For now, it is time for me to get back to, well, sorting these resistors on my electronics workbench.